Greetings Lore Seekers and welcome to another episode of The Lost Archives, a Star Wars Legends lore series. So today I will be discussing the Empire of the Hand, something that's a bit of an unknown to even many people in the Star Wars galaxy. So what is the Empire of the Hand? Well, essentially they're an extension of the Galactic Empire and it is the pet project of Grand Admiral Thrawn. Something he'd been working on since before he joined the Empire, after he'd been exiled from the Chissa Sentry, after coming into contact with Darth Sidious. Now, this project he was able to sell to Palpatine, or Sidious as he's also known, in order to pacify the Unknown Regions, as well as prepare it for threats that exist within the Unknown Regions, as well as galactic or extra-galactic threats known to the Chiss as the Fire Outsiders. Those of you in the know know that was eventually proven to be the Yuuzhan Vong. Now, by the time of the New Republic, after the Empire had fallen, they had amassed about 250 sectors worth of territory. Now, for a comparison, the successor to the Galactic Empire, the Imperial Remnant, or the True Empire as it was known, at the time only had about 8 sectors. So this other empire turning over its territory to the Remnant would have been a really big problem to the New Republic. Thankfully, Mara and Luke managed to prevent them from gaining any contact with the Imperial Remnant and revealed that the plot that was going on there was false. This kind of allowed the Empire of the Hand to continue operating as its own state. Anyway, uh, I'm going to get back on task as that will be a its own video in the future. So, back on subject, they managed to achieve this by making alliances and absorbing lesser states into its fold. Now, they also did this by making alliances and making good friends of the Chiss Ascendry, despite the Chiss Ascendry's disdain for Thrawn. Those Chiss who secretly supported Thrawn would funnel troops, weapons and armaments into the Empire of the Hand as well as any ship's personnel that could be sneakily taken off the records of the Galactic Empire were also funnelled to the Empire of the Hand by Palpatine and the select few officers who knew about it. Another way in which the Empire of the Hand managed to increase its reach and power in the Unknown Regions was also by providing anti-invader and anti-pirate services. Now, considering this sort of setup, it meant that this was more of a confederacy of systems than an actual empire. The reason why they called themselves the Empire of the Hand was to reflect their ties to Palpatine's new order. Though they kind of sidestepped his megalomania, and it is actually for this reason that many people joined Fronn's ranks in the Empire of the Hand including many of the Imperial officers who originally joined the Empire thinking it would be a good idea. One such example of this would be the Imperial Baron turned Rebel Ace, Sonitar Fell. Those of you who know who he is, uh, especially if you've seen the Rebel cartoon series, he is an Imperial TIE Fighter Ace pilot who eventually defected to the Rebel Alliance. After he was captured by Imperial forces, Fell was offered by Thrawn to join his Empire describing it as a true empire that is just. Taken in by Thrawn's pro charisma and the opportunity that he was offering, he accepted. The Alliance, however, believed he was captured and then suddenly executed by the Rebellion. One thing of note as well is that they did away with the Tarkin Doctory and also the anti-alien xenophobia that the Empire had institutionalised. This meant that they could recruit many different aliens and different forces to their group. This actually helped recruiting their numbers, especially seeing as the majority of the races in the Unknown Regions are races that are generally not known to the rest of the Star Wars galaxy. That leads me on to my next topic. How did they differ from the Empire? Firstly, as they are not using the Tarkin Doctory, they didn't have the emphasis on overwhelming force, superior firepower, and the fear that came with using this sort of power projection. So this is how they did away with Palpatine's megalomania. Instead, when it came to warfare, they followed Thrawn's ideals of war. It was a combination of Chiss and Imperial tactics, personally arranged by Thrawn himself. Such examples would be respect of the enemy, careful consideration of soldiers' lives, surgical strikes, 
preventative strikes, demonstrative invasions, and the significant use of intelligence gathering. In Fawn's particular case, this was the gathering of enemies' artwork and studying it to reveal how enemies would react. Many of these doctrines and beliefs of the Empire of the Ham would eventually find its way into the Imperial Remnant. This, I believe, is actually due to Fawn's prodigy, Glad Pelion, who helped form the Imperial Remnant and was elected as its very first Supreme Commander and Leader. But that will be saved for its own video on the Imperial Remnant. I will now move on to their technology and setup and various branches of the military. So, a lot of the technological designs they used were taken from the Empire. This is including the iconic Star Destroyer, Walkers, and most importantly, Stormtrooper armor. Most of this was kept for the psychological value and history traditions of the Empire. However, they did completely do away with the standard TIE series. Instead, a lot them to use a type of craft known as the Claw Craft. This was a creation of a joint engineering feature between Imperial Engineers and Chiss Ascendry Engineers. I know I've referenced the Chiss a few times, the Chiss are actually Thrawn's people. Now the Claw Craft had the firepower and maneuverability of an X-Wing but also lacked the weaknesses of the TIE series, so it did actually have shields and it did have its own personal hyperdrive, though this was fairly more limited than other variants you'd find on Alliance ships. Though one thing it did carry over from the TIE series design was the cockpit, so imagine you've got TIE fighter cockpit, then four outstretching arms that come to the front of the TIE cockpit with four laser with a laser cannon on each strut. It is actually commented on by a New Republic soldier when they actually meet these is that it has both the design of the cockpit and the wings of an X-Wing. And then speculating on the psychological effects this was, would be to cause to both factions. In fact, so successful was this starfighter it would serve as the primary starfighter force of both the Chiss Ascendry and the Empire of the Hand, with various variants being developed. Anyway, moving back on. They also had many different variants of Star Destroyer. One of these was a Chiss variant, which was a more sneaker model of the ship, as well as lacking the major weakness of all Imperial Star Destroyers and Star Dreadnoughts, that being the exposed bridge at the top of a command tower. The bridge on the Chiss Star Destroyers was more worked into the frame of the ship, where it was more heavily armoured. That means no cheeky rebel pilot is going to be able to get the drop on this ship like it did on the Executor in Episode 6, Return of the Jedi. In fact, thinking about how many varying different class of ships the Empire of the Hand did, that could be its own video in on itself, from its very multi-functional ships to its specific combat roles. If you would like to hear about that, please drop a comment in the section below, and I'll eventually get around to doing that if enough people would want me to do it. Now obviously they had their own navy, as I've mentioned with the Starfighter Squadron to that. They also had their own core of stormtroopers. Now this stormtrooper core was trained by a previous group I've mentioned called the Hand of Judgment. These were a group of rebel stormtroopers who still wanted to serve the Empire but didn't want to fall victim to the overzealousness of the Imperial Security Bureau after a general misunderstanding of not wanting to shoot civilians. They spent quite a bit of time dealing with pirates, slavers and various injustices around the galaxy until eventually they were recruited by Thrawn to train his own corps of stormtroopers. As such, the Hand of Judgment named this new unit the 501st Legion, with them saying, well we may as well aim high if we want to be the best, with Thrawn agreeing. Now, at the time the 501st Legion would still be in existence when this unit was formed, but I don't think that really mattered, as at the time the Empire of the Hand was completely off the grid to the rest of the galaxy. That being said, they also gave out Stormtrooper armor to any local defence forces that actually joined the Empire of the Hand, thus ensuring that to the people of the Unknown Regions, the Stormtroopers were their protectors, not the aggressive nature they served under Palpatine's regime. 
as noted, these Stormtrooper cores were supported by various mechanised units. You had the typical AT-AT, AT-ST, as well as varying tanks from the Empire, as well as Mega Maze tanks, which was a Chiss creation, mortar tanks, rapid fire tanks, as well as air streakers, air speeders, and rocket speeders, which you'd more usually see in the hands of the Alliance. Thrawn was nothing but not careful with his resources and made sure to use everything to the best of their advantage, including the use of various Imperial Juggernauts, which was a, a HCVW A9 turbo tank variant. Moving on to their space stations and installations, they mostly used the standard hyperlevelocity velocity gun that the Empire employed on the Golan defence platforms, as well as auto-class stations for planetary defence. Now, they also made their own space stations. These would be various defence platform class things and even some borrowed from the Chiss Ascendry. Actually, moving on to the Chiss Ascendry, Thrawn, despite the disdain of the ruling family, actually went and formed his own house in Chiss society, which was known as House Phalanx. Now, this was a typical Chiss military organization though it was not best viewed by the ruling families as this was essentially seen as Thrawn's own personal warrior retinue as much that mean meant he was not respected even more by the ruling families however this did give any chiss sympathizers in his own people a place and platform to talk and support about him. This also is what contributed to many Chiss joining his faction, which is where you'd see various Chiss troops and Chiss commandos joining the Empire of the Hand, as well as the personal parallax soldiers that would guard the house on the Chiss Ascendry homeworld. But alas, all things golden must eventually come to an end. At about nine years after the Battle of Yavin, Thrawn left the Unknown Regions and went to see what had been going on with everything in the main galaxy. But before he left, he said to the people of his little empire, don't worry, if you hear any rumours or reports of my death, look to my return ten years from that time. What they didn't know is Thrawn, being the sneaky bugger that he'd always been, had his own secret cloning facility on the planet, which he'd restart the process every time he popped by, with a 10 year countdown. And I do think he may have actually popped back there somehow during the time of the Thrawn trilogy, because they were notably Yan Salamari in the tank. Now, what Yan Salamari are are creatures that actually negate the Force. How they are still living, despite not, you know, having the thing that surrounds everything and is created by life, is an entirely different question which will be covered later on. Uh, you know, I may move that one up the list because it's quite an interesting story. But yes, after the, the left of Thrawn, they carried on for over 10 years before they heard that Thrawn might have returned, so they sent out various scouting forces into the galaxy. Then an event came that shook the very core of the foundation of the Star Wars galaxy. That's going to get its own video. I know I keep saying that a lot, but I'll get there eventually. And it seemed that the Chiss Ascendry absorbed the Empire of the Hand into its own government and formations. However, that wasn't actually true. The Empire of the Hand still existed as its own separate state as the head of the Imperial Remnant discovered, but kept to himself until he reached out to them and asked them for diplomatic and military aid. And I'm quoting when I say this. You've been granted an honour, Admiral. You're the first to behold a secret finally come to light. You're looking at the vanguard of the Empire of the Hand. That was said to Admiral Natasi Dala, those of you who know her, you know the shenanigans she gets up to, by Imperial Remnant Head of State Jagged Fell, Sonitar Fell's son, as she tries to wrestle control of the Remnant away from him. 
that was one of the best moments in that book actually when they finally came back anyway guys if you like what you heard feel free to subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with more lore videos maybe leave me some comments maybe a bit of feedback as that will help me out a great deal like I said, if you want me to go through a full detail of their full ships and listings, please drop a comment down below. And I will catch you on the next episode of the Lost Archives. Take care, Lawseekers, and have a good day.